Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Bob Lannan. I'm a developer at Sunlight Labs. I'm here with uh, Amy Nye, uh, Joshua Hatch, uh, Liz Bartolomeo, and Kathy Keeley. And uh, today we're going to talk to you about ad hoc, uh, which is an audio identifica identification system uh, for identifying political campaign advertisements that has been uh, made into uh, an Android and iPhone uh, application. Um, ad hoc addresses a very specific problem. Um, for the average voter, <clears throat> there's a, what I like to call a, a de facto firewall between them and information that is val valuable uh, when making their decisions this year. Uh, the average voter is inundated with advertisements from both TV and radio, and increasingly also the internet. Um, and when a voter encounters these ads, uh, um, the, the volume is uh, large, which isn't unique to this, uh, to the current election cycle, but uh, what is changing is the multiplicity of the sources of the ads. <clears throat> so when a voter hears an ad and uh, the ad raises a question in their mind as to who uh, sponsored this ad and uh, who is associated with that sponsor and what is their, uh, what are their uh, uh, political and financial affiliations, um, there is uh, an immediate need to, to sort of know who that is and, and find out details about them. Uh, unfortunately, their laptop is on the other side of the room. So uh, by the time uh, they, get, uh, they get closer to uh, actually walking to a portal of the internet, uh, the desire for that information may wane. Uh, and by the time they actually log on to a computer, uh, they're possibly searching for something entirely different. Um, the point of a system like ad hoc is to catch someone uh, at just that uh, moment where they're most hungry for this information uh, and to serve it up to them uh, in, a, in a frictionless way. What ad hoc does is it sits as an application on your mobile device, it listens to uh, a political advertisement and generates an audio fingerprint. It sends that fingerprint as a query to a central ad database, which returns information about the sponsor, uh, financial data associated, uh, the candidates uh, involved, and links to journalistic resources found elsewhere uh, uh, at the Sunlight Foundation's uh, family of sites. And the point is to catch the voter at just this moment in their viewing of an ad so that we can fill in the blanks and let them know uh, the, the crucial information about the uh, vested interests in the messages that they're seeing. Today I'd like to talk uh, about three main topics, about uh, to give uh, a, a high level uh, walkthrough of how ad hoc itself works and to give a, a look at the ad hoc archive which is what ad hoc depends upon to return results to users. Uh, finally, I'd like to look at, um, I'd like to show you a little bit about the usage data so far uh, with uh, ad hoc users that have voluntarily uh, chosen to share information with us so that we can learn more about both how, how the ad hoc system is being used and also um, the geographic distribution of the ads that have been identified by the system. For some context, uh, a recent post by uh, Jay Carper on the on Sunlight on the Sunlight Foundation's reporting site uh, 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 quotes um, $810 million in out outside spending um, that Sunlight's Follow the Unlimited Money has tracked since the beginning of the campaign cycle, and more than half of that has been laid out in the past six weeks. Uh, you can see this uh, this sort of astronomical uh, 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 increase in uh, ad spending. Uh, in the last month. Let's see how ad hoc goes about giving you the information that you need uh, to um, put this, to put an individual ad in context. At the core of the ad hoc system is the echo print uh, um, 
uh, software developed by uh, the good folks at the Echo Nest, uh, a, a website that I highly recommend for uh, anyone who's interested in audio hacking and um, and, uh, and, mu and audio identification systems. Echo Print was originally developed uh, as a as an open source version of the kinds of applications that have been on mobile apps for the last 10 years or so, uh, such as Shazam or SoundHound. Um, and what EchoPrint does is uh, it takes the uh, audio signal coming from any arbitrary source, uh, and this is, I'm sorry, this is uh, time by uh, frequency. Um, so the Signal is processed uh, window by window, slice by slice, uh, and for each slice, uh, a code and an offset is generated by an algorithm in the uh, uh, called Echo Print. So, what this process ultimately produces is um, for a bunch of uh, audio files, uh, we'll produce a bunch of uh, text files filled with the fingerprint information, information about the audio that's, uh, that, that was extracted uh, from each of those files. Uh, what we then do is, um, uh, so sourcing, you know, sourcing uh, political advertisements, we feed them through the echo print process and store the results of that printing in a fingerprint database. Uh, each ad gets a unique identifier, and that unique identifier can be attached to um, to any kind of metadata that we can uh, provide uh, through um, the process of reporting and, and investigating these individual sponsors and groups. So when you hear an ad on your phone, up here is the user's experience. Um, when you hear an ad on your phone, uh, Echo Nest, Echo Print is always the is always um, embedded inside of the inside of a phone that has ad hoc installed. Uh, so after it hears an ad, it generates another one of these fingerprints and contacts the search API to ask, "Have you? Do you have anything stored uh, that matches this document?" Uh, as a result, it will get um, the kinds of um, the kinds of information that uh, Sunlight has been uh, responsible for gathering over the years, including uh, brief bios of the sponsor of that ad, um, the information on their uh, spending totals for the year, and how their spending breaks out positive and negative uh, towards Republican and Democratic uh, um, uh, candidates. Uh, there are also links to the Follow the Unlimited Money site and to profiles of the sponsor on InfluenceExplorer.com. As a byproduct of collecting all of these advertisements and, and, and uh, tagging them with rich data, uh, the Ad Hoc Project has produced, the, um, has produced a repository of more than 3,500 advertisements. The ad, hoc, the ad hoc archive is uh, has has gotten uh, very large. These are um, 3,500 advertisements from the 2012 cycle. Uh, so far, um, it's that number has exploded recently. Um, and um, each now each one of these uh, was sourced from uh, publicly available uh, video feeds uh, and hand checked uh, for their. Uh, hand-checked and verified to be advertisements, uh, mostly by uh, 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 Joshua Hatch. Uh, I, I lent a little bit, but nowhere near. I didn't expose myself to nearly as many ads as, uh, as he did. So um, congratulations, Joshua, on uh, not losing your mind. I suffered no lasting damage from watching 6,000 ads, <laughs> and I approve this message. Uh, what's interesting is if we look at the ad hoc archive, uh, we do source. Uh, we do um, keep track of when ads were published to these video feeds, um, and as you can see, that rise in super PAC spending, um, which is you know which patterned similarly to the rise in overall outside spending that we looked at earlier, um, 
is mirrored uh, almost directly in the uh, in the um, weekly counts of new ads that were posted. Um, this is uh, so you know in the last six weeks. So uh, we we have up to um, we have uh, here as the primary season. Um, right after that, uh, when um, Romney was named uh, um, presumptive nominee, there was a slight bump uh, as uh, as the presidential campaigns got uh, fired up, and uh, of course, in the last uh, month and a half, uh, we've seen uh, just just an unbelievable uh, increase in the amount of ads uh, that that our system has taken in. Um, uh, this archive is searchable. So uh, I'm going to switch to a browser real quick so we can see uh, what that searching is like. So, and just to be clear, this is a different way of searching than you would uh, than you than um, you would experience by using the ad hoc mobile application. And the ad hoc mobile application is uh, is really great for in situ searching uh, at, it, it, when you have it listened to media, uh, but when we Want to if we're curious about uh, the overall patterns of ads and, and ads that are um, that are uh, and you know looking at the record of ads over um, the entire cycle, uh, we can go to adhoc.sunlightfoundation.com and up here search the ads by the sponsor name or by the title of the ad. Now the title of the ad is. Uh, sometimes a little bit arbitrary, um, not, is not always terribly revealing of the content of that ad. Uh, but we also, this search also indexes the, um, the, any description that the sponsor themselves has uh, contributed uh, to give an idea of uh, what the content is. So uh, if we looked at a, a contentious uh, topic in uh, the political um, campaigns this year, uh, such as jobs, um, we can get back a result. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see how many we have here. Uh, uh, it looks like looks like maybe around seventy uh, ads that have um, that come from a number of different funders. And you know, in some cases, uh, what's matched here is the part of the title. In some cases. Uh, it's probably the sponsor's name or, or, a, or a description of that ad. So um, when we get these ad results back, um, we have the opportunity to narrow the search results. We can narrow it by funder, and uh, the funder names also include a pointer to the, the type of committee that they are, um, which uh, is listed below. Um, <clears throat> we can we can list them by the uh, party that the funder uh, leans to, the party that they uh, typically um, support. Um, and sometimes they support by opposing um, uh, uh, the, the opposition party. Uh, or we can go by the funder type. So um, uh, one of the most popular is the super PAC. Um, they're certainly responsible for a lot of the ads in this season. Uh, so we can look at uh, just those results. And that narrows it down to uh, some of these. And uh, Communication Workers of America, that's a heavy hitter. Maybe we can look at some of their, uh, their advertisements. And if we click through, uh, we can see the profile uh, for this ad. <laughs> Uh, the profile of the ad gives us uh, the sponsor information. It calls out if the if the sponsor is a super PAC, lets you know. Uh, gives a brief bio about that sponsor, and um, also gives us the spending breakdown uh, of their uh, involvement in uh, in the 2012 uh, election cycle. Um, this is sourced from uh, the uh, efforts of the um, Follow the Unlimited Money team. Uh, for super PACs and uh, gives you a really clear uh, view of um, how their money has been put to work. We can see that a lot of uh, a lot of what's been spent here was uh, in opposition to Republican candidates. 
We can also see their top contributors sourced from the influenceexplorer.com. Um, and uh, it will list the top 10 and, and their total contributions to this uh, uh, sponsor. Um, incidentally, uh, for, um, for those not well versed in uh, campaign finance jargon, uh, we also have some definitions of some uh, lesser known terms. So, uh, you know, uh, we give a very specific uh, definition of the super PAC. Um, and we also um, have a full glossary of uh, other terms that have to do with uh, dark money, uh, 501Cs, uh, the history of uh, campaign contributions, um, and, uh, and uh, independent expenditures. Um, we also have links to the Follow, un Follow the Unlimited Money page and the Influence Explorer page associated with this uh, funder. I should say, uh, after that demo, um, if anybody has any questions about uh, how else to use it, um, one other thing I could point out is that at the top of any ad profile page, um, clicking on the name of the sponsor gives you all of their ads uh, so that you don't need to search for the um, search for, you know, by title or anything like that. Um, this gives us uh, all the ads uh, made by uh, the Communication Workers of America. Um, it's three pages full, so that's pretty sizable. <clears throat> um, and clicking on any one of these ads will actually take you to um, the full video of the ad. Okay. Uh, finally, the, as a um, as a byproduct of uh, of users uh, using this data, we uh, we get location-based data for each query that comes into our system. Um, and what this gives us is an idea of not only who's using uh, the ad around the country, or who's using the app around the country, but also, um, of course, we, we get some location and time information for the ad that was identified because we remember which, uh, which ad we uh, returned for that query. So um, this is uh, to give you an idea of how, uh, how widely the app has been used uh, around the country. Um, we, uh, we can see a lot of concentration in uh, swing states and uh, in major metropolitan areas, but also some uh, representation uh, out, you know, outside of the typical coastal and, uh, and uh, Midwest cities. But um, uh, so the uh, sharing location data is opt-in, and, and about half of the queries we've received have uh, come with uh, latlons for uh, where they were sent from. And, um, and this gives us, uh, you know, a really powerful tool to sort of uh, to crowdsource uh, a, a, sur a survey of uh, which ads are airing in uh, which districts uh, and, and, and which media markets. Um, this location data could be paired with, uh, you know, shape files that um, define media markets. Uh, it could also be paired with uh, congressional districts um, uh, uh, or at a county level um, to see uh, which messages were being uh, um, pushed by campaigns uh, in which contexts. Um, another really good uh, mashup potential uh, that uh, I'd also like to mention um, is uh, the kind of mashup that could take place with the Political Ad Sleuth project. Um, ad hoc uh, will have uh, you know a healthy amount of data for um, that would be able to associate ad content with uh, a sponsor, a time, and a location. Uh, and Political Ad Sleuth. Um, complements that data. Uh, also with uh, sponsor time and location uh, data sourced from publicly available uh, ad buy contracts that um, where a sponsor has, uh, has entered into a contract with a, a television broadcaster and reserved a space in a given media market for a given time on a given day. Um, so they can, so the political ad sleuth data can complement the ad hoc data by also 
offering us the uh, TV station uh, that it was uh, likely broadcast on at that time in that place and the cost of the individual ad. Um, together, this is a very, uh, you know, complete uh, rounded out picture of um, most of what you'd want to know about a, 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 a campaign advertisement. Um, other databases that offer this kind of information are um, astronomically expensive. Um, uh, right now, they have a lot more coverage. They're a lot more complete, but with uh, higher participation um, in usership on ad hoc and in uh, volunteer uh, participation of political ad sleuth, uh, I think this pairing has the potential to offer uh, just as valuable a research, uh, resource. Bob, can you talk to us a little bit more about you know, how many uses or how many how, how many hits the app has had? Uh, so we've we've answered about um, sixty five hundred queries uh, so far and uh, successfully. Um, so uh, um, and that's spread out over. Uh, I, our, our usership is around the same, so I think I think we're probably averaging uh, one or two queries per user, um, uh, and we'd certainly like to, um, you know, engage a lot more on that scale to to get to get regular usership um, because, as I said, the the more queries we get, um, the more the more data we end up with at the end of uh, at the end of months of uh, of serving data. This is Kathy Kiley from the reporting <coughs> group. Uh, one way that we can use that data is to um, uh, figure out not only who's behind the ads, which is what we're using our ad sleuth uh, site for, but also to try to figure out what the advertising is. We had a good example of that this week uh, when we saw recent filings that there was a big uh, dump at the Federal Election Commission this week, and we noticed that. Uh, right after, uh, it was newsy because we had, as you probably know, uh, there have been a couple of uh, shooting incidents in the Midwest, one in uh, Michigan where there's a sniper at loose and the other in Wisconsin where for the second time this year the state had seen this uh, mass shooting. And we noticed uh, in these FEC filings that uh, the national, or in our ad sleuth database rather, that the National Rifle Association is advertising in both states but we don't know what the ads are. So uh, if we have users out there who are uploading this information, letting us know, because some organizations put their ads on YouTube, it's easy for us to find, others do not. And uh, as a reporter, that makes my news antenna go up. I want to know what the ads are. So if you're seeing these ads and you can let us know about them, uh, it helps us build our database and uh, draw, make a much richer picture, I think, of what the political landscape looks like and helps inform voters uh, of who is behind the advertising and who's trying to influence the election. Yeah, I think that's <clears throat> a really good point. And uh, we can also, um, there, there's, there are certain clues that we can get from the advertisers' own descriptions of videos that they posted through feeds uh, for location data. But um, they're obviously under no obligation to do that, and uh, and um, so yes, yeah, as, as as Kathy pointed out, the the more um, the more active involvement we get from users, the more we can sort of flesh out that idea of uh, what's being aired where. Can you tell us about how uh, frequent the data is <coughs> updated in terms of ads, and also in terms of the um, the profile for each of the uh, yeah, so uh, uh, Joshua and I get three emails a day from an automated system that's, uh, that is, the, the system is just constantly listening for uh, new additions to the public video feeds of, uh, of um, uh, uh, campaign advertising sponsors. Um, when they post something new, we, um, we pull it in and we uh, give it the once over uh, to, to, to make sure that the video that's come in is in fact an advertisement and um, then tag it as such and it gets downloaded uh, immediately afterwards, fingerprinted and stored. Yeah, I'll just add to it. So we have about 300 entities that we've um, looked at. These are the entities that have the 
there's about 15,000 registered groups at the FEC, um, but there's only several hundred that are really actively involved in raising and spending money. So we went through that list and identified, and you know, most of the ones that run ads, um, they, they do these ads because they want them to be seen. And so they post them on their websites, on the YouTube channels, and so on. So we, we um, find those and, and, and build a database of those, uh, of those channels and scrape those videos. But a lot of times these groups will post videos that aren't, not, that aren't advertisements. And so in an effort to eliminate false matches and reduce noise, we um, uh, do a, a, a sort of a, a quick look through at all the new ads that get posted and identify those that, yes, we think these are ads, and eliminate those that are not. Now, sometimes you think that's going to be a, an obvious call, but actually it's, it's sometimes a little trickier than you think because uh, uh, there are web ads that uh, are of indeterminate length. Um, some ads will, uh, uh, some, some groups will produce a 30-second ad that gets replicated all around the country. So it might say that uh, so-and-so is uh, ruining this country. Uh, uh, isn't it horrible? Shouldn't you do something? And the first 28 seconds are exactly the same. The last two seconds are, so vote for John Smith or vote for uh, you know, uh, Jack Daniels or whomever. And so what you end up with are a number of ads that are essentially identical, except for the end. Um, and uh, so there are some, some things that we have to do to, to try and um, to deal with that. The last, the last uh, point on this is that uh, um, uh, it's obviously an imperfect system. It's, it's as good as we can get it at the moment, We're continually refining it. But you also find issues like uh, sometimes outfits will post somebody else's ad on their channel. Uh, so, you know, there are a number of things we have to do to try and, and keep the data as clean as possible. Uh, but then also relying on users to help inform us if they uh, spot something that might be awry. And also, I think relying on users to uh, help us spot ads that aren't being posted because, uh, as I said earlier, I think that's what makes uh, reporters' news antenna go up, and it certainly should make uh, citizens' antennas go up when people, it's the ads that people don't want to put on the internet that are potentially the newsiest, and that's where we really have to rely on uh, boots on the ground, people who are actually in these markets using this tool to alert us to those advertisements so that we can get them uh, into the database and make them part of our database to, to fill out this picture. So I think what this is to me, what's exciting about it is it's a way that you can use technology to enhance human intelligence. But the human intelligence is key, both the human intelligence that's applied here at Sunlight, uh, as Josh described, but also the human intelligence that's applied uh, when you use your smartphones to upload this information and to let us know about gaps in the database. The cookie cutter ads that, uh, that, that, that Joshua brought up was, are, are a really interesting case and, and were uh, sort of a challenge for us early on um, because as he mentioned that you know most of the ad is the same with, uh, with, with short uh, intervals that are tailored to a, a specific congressional district. Um, so uh, one way that we've been able to do this, and it's sort of, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a unique way of kind of leveraging how this data gets stored. As I mentioned before, the, um, the uh, fingerprinting process produces, uh, produces text files. Um, and, you know, any query that's coming in is being matched against these text files. Um, so uh, it's also possible to compare all of the text files in the database with each other. Um, we made uh, uh, good use of the uh, super fast match system um, developed uh, at, at Sunlight and at the, um, at, and at the uh, super fast match system has been very good at uh, finding these cookie cutter ads. It's been very good at finding ads that are mostly identical because most of their um, profile data uh, would be identical. Um, uh, the, it, it's also very good, uh, incidentally, at finding uh, two ads whose uh, language uh, data are different, but whose background music is the same. 
uh, which may mean that we need to attenuate the system a little bit to pay better attention to voices and less, less attention to background music. But as it turns out, scary background music gets reused uh, a lot by uh, different campaigns. That was the Media Standards Trust was the uh, other place where Super Fast Match was uh, developed. <laughs> And please let us know. Um, I think we're eager, as you've heard, to find out uh, ways to uh, ideas for using this tool. Uh, the nice thing about Sunlight Tools is they are open source, so they're available for adaptation. We're also uh, happy to hear from folks. If you're not a developer or not an expert, uh, we have folks in our communication shop and in our reporting shop who are happy to help you uh, find ways to use this tool to localize stories or to use it, I'm speaking from a journalist perspective, but I'm sure there uh, may be some uses that citizen activists can think of. But I think it's a way that uh, you can uh, build transparency and engagement. I think democracy is all about being engaged, and this is another way to get there. So we're happy to help you do that. Interestingly, too, um, uh, Nadia mentioned it, when, when we looked at the location data, uh, we have uh, not very heavy, but some usership in um, almost every continent. Um, we have some queries from China, uh, Japan, India, Turkey, um, uh, different locations in the EU, Africa. So, um, and we've heard some feedback from uh, international users that they'd love to appropriate this uh, for their country. Um, I'm, I'm currently talking to the organizers of the Random Hacks of Kindness event. Uh, this winter uh, about doing a weekend-long workshop, uh, basically how to set up your own personal ad hoc system, uh, in, you know, in other countries, uh, so that they so that um, they can approximate the same system that we have, uh, because it generalizes pretty directly to any other um, uh, uh, um, election that is influenced by uh, outside spending in the form of uh, television or radio advertising which is a lot of them, from what I hear. <laughs> so um, before, uh, before I wrap up, I just wanted to mention um, the other developers uh, that were involved on this project. Uh, um, uh, Daniel Cloud and Eric Mill uh, very quickly got us up to speed with, uh, with full, fully functional uh, mobile applications. Um, Amy Ciesel, uh also worked at breakneck pace to um, make sure that everything uh, looked right and, 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 and that the user experience was, uh, uh, was complete. Um, Joshua Hatch, Ryan Sibley, Jacob Fenton, and Nico uh, Margolias uh, contributed a lot to the reporting, the content, uh, uh, and the um, definitions of jargon terms uh, that are, that are really the core of what ad hoc offers to its users. Um, the initial prototype was developed as a hackathon project in December 2011 for the Random Hacks of Kindness hackathon. Uh, and uh, the uh, parties on that team were Jim Snavely, Pam Selly, Erica Owens, Jake Richter, and myself. Um, and I did the uh, web app and API development. 